Welcome to the session called Climate Change, Refugees, and the Political Drift to the Right. I'll be serving as your moderator. I'm Ray Suarez. Good to see you all. Great to be back in San Francisco. And really, a, an all-star panel to discuss one of the less talked about aspects of this problem. We've got the primer uh, from Tom in the film, Tom Friedman from the New York Times, Luis Alberto Moreno, the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, Heidi Cullen, the director of communications and strategic initiatives for the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and last, all the way down there on the end, Kevin Rudd, now head of the Asia Society, former prime minister of Australia. Please welcome the panel. Good evening, and thank you for joining us here at Fort Mason tonight for this special World Affairs broadcast from the Coal and Ice Spotlight on Climate Solutions Symposium. It's my great pleasure to be here for a conversation with Heidi Cullen, Tom Friedman, Luis Alberto Moreno, and Kevin Rudd, to discuss what might be the most pressing issues of our time. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that we're recording tonight's conversation for radio and podcast, so please take a moment to silence your cell phones, right? But you don't have to be silent. <laughs> so if you hear something that surprises you, be surprised. If you hear something that shocks you, be shocked. If you hear something that amuses you, be amused. You are not here as potted plants. You are here as a live audience. For those of you here in the audience tonight, we will have question cards available. If you'd like to contribute a written question, please raise your hand and someone will bring you a card. Luis Alberto Moreno, let me start with you. You've written that political conditions are uncertain. Climate change is not. Why is this such a rarely discussed part of the climate issue? If you turn on the television in much of the world, turn on the radio in much of the world, you'll hear reporting on the science, on the politics, but you won't hear so much about the fact that tens of millions of people won't be able to make a living in the places they're living in today. Well, Ray, this is a very good question. It goes back to a little bit of what uh, Tom was just describing. Let me give you an example that gets a lot of attention lately in the United States, and that's the number of illegal immigrants that are coming. Where are those illegal immigrants coming from? Largely today from what's typically referred to as the Northern Triangle countries, which are Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Those three countries together are about 30 million people. If you step back for a minute and you think, okay, Latin America as a whole has about 8% of the world's population, and it has about a third of the world's biodiversity. And especially if you look at South America, and you think of the global commons that, is that, that one could see there is the Amazon, which produces about a third of the salt water of the world. What has happened, and why is it that these countries in the Northern Triangle, people who don't speak English, are willing to really get on a, on a trajectory to put their life at risk, to put their children's life at risk to come to the United States. So let me give you examples. Coffee. These countries are perhaps the most vulnerable countries in terms of climate change effects. You might remember you, you covered that with Mitch, which basically almost destroyed Honduras. And in those countries, the resilience is very, very limited. So in the case of coffee, because of these changes in weather, you are getting rust on the coffee trees. And the production of coffee is coming down significantly. We actually are seeing places where people migrate out of those places. And only when, the, for instance, the quality of the water is being destroyed. And everybody looks at perhaps more the, issue, the immediate issue but not what is the root cause of the issue. Those three countries together 
we'll have about 10 million people that need to enter into the labor force in the next 10 years. And yet, they're not finding jobs. And if something is not done fundamentally to change that equation, and that is a development challenge, which is totally tied to climate change, you are going to see those numbers explode. In fact, this year alone, just from these three countries, in the first half of the year, you had more illegal immigrants than all of last year. So as much as this is changing, I think it requires, of course, a holistic approach and to understand that at the root of this, there is a fundamental climate change dynamic that we seldom look at. And if we don't look at it, you can do everything you can to bring industry, to do a lot of things, but people will continue to migrate because their places of production, as Tom was describing, in the case of Senegal, are simply becoming smaller. And we've seen the effect that it's had on politics in the United States. Yet for all the transformation of the debate over immigration. This was not a debate we were having in the same way in the late 90s, when unemployment was low, when there was still a lot of labor hunger in a lot of places in the country. Here we are down at 3.9% unemployment. It's not a crisis being caused by, by immigrants coming from other places, but it's transforming the debate in the United States. Kevin Rudd People have gotten on boats from all over the Indian Ocean and South Pacific to head toward Australia. What's it done, what's it done to the politics of your country? I think consistent with uh, right across the Western world and other places as well, uh, the large-scale movements of people um, is pushing the politics of these countries further to the right. You see it in the United States, you see it in my own country. Um, I was in Sweden just a week or two ago. We've seen the results of the Swedish election. Uh, it's there. So the real question for me is, on the one hand, what do we do to deal with root causes? We're now here talking about climate, and, uh, and uh, Tom has given us the most graphic, in-your-face presentation, the dynamics in uh, North Africa and the Middle East. And secondly, what do you also do to have a humane, coherent, global response to this movement in the here and now? Surely it is within our collective political wit and imagination across the planet that we can do both these things. But instead, what we have is a collective burying of our political heads in the sand because it's seen in the central body politic as being kind of tomorrow's big problem. Climate change is an intergenerational thing. It's, it's, it's assumed in many parts of the world. Dealing with what we've just discussed as being climate-related, climate-induced refugees is seen as a big problem for tomorrow. Let's bury our head in the sand uh, again. And if you are seeking to argue both these things in your national politics today as real and fundamental to how we are going to be and survive as decent nations, then the right of politics, and in particular the far right of politics, basically depicts you as being something of a left-wing loony and potentially dangerous until all this comes crashing down on us. One example in terms of the politics of Europe, in the space of three years, really, since the events uh, really unfolded in Syria, uh, then it has been this central dynamic in the Brexit debate, central dynamic in the German elections, central dynamic in what's unfolded now across what was seen to be the ultimate source of uh, European compassion, the Scandinavians of Northern Europe. So unless we actually deal with this in the here and now, then the trend that we've seen so far is going to get worse. My final point, I suppose, is on the causal questions, which is action on the planet. Uh, we've sort of drifted into what I describe as a post-Paris complacency. We thought Paris fixed things. If Paris was fully implemented, it actually represents, in its agreed set of national actions, one-third of the actions necessary to keep global temperature increases within two degrees. Tom's just given us the Senegal example. Uh, so 
the call to arms we heard yesterday from the Secretary General of the UN is essential uh, if we're going to deal with causalities. And finally, on dealing with the problem, one way of de-escalating the fear factor in the national politics of our various countries, which is so easy to exploit by the politics of the far right, is if we, the international community, devise a system for handling asylum seekers and refugees, which is globally distributed. At present, the de facto understanding around the world is if you have a bunch of refugees arrive or asylum seekers arrive in adjoining countries to where the problem is, it's their problem. You saw this in the case of Syria. The outflow went to Lebanon, it went to um, uh, Turkey, it also went to Jordan. And so Europe and the rest of the world said, not our problem. Whereas the reality is it's actually gone everywhere and not just there, but it's reflections elsewhere around the planet. So why not a new global arrangement whereby if there is, for example, an addition of three million people to the annual refugees caseload each year, then based upon our global national capacities, we distribute this equitably so that people are taken into countries uh, uh, relative to our proportion of the global economy. At present, we've got major economies like Japan who do not take a single refugee. That is just bloody wrong, okay, in the 21st century. Um, countries like the United States, until you've had the, the Trump stuff recently, you're taking at least 75,000 people from the UNHCR each year. Canada, uh, under Trudeau, taking about 30,000. When we're in office, we're taking about 20,000 a year. But that only adds up to about 120, 130,000 a year. The reason why individual voters get upset in individual countries, they think they're doing everything in their country. Austria's carrying the burden, Sweden's carrying the burden, Britain's carrying the burden, Australia's carrying the burden. A global proportional distribution of the, let's call it the absorption function, uh, is a way of lessening the political angst which comes from this and regularizing what will be with us as a major political problem for decades to come. Otherwise, we simply concede the ground to an increasingly racist right. Heidi Cullen, you heard Kevin Rudd refer to the perception of this as a problem for tomorrow. I think we ought to remind people that a lot of this is already baked in the cake, which makes this a problem from hell in a lot of ways. Even if we shut off all the smokestacks, there'd still be climate change that has to play out for years to come. Isn't that correct? That is correct. That is correct. And that is why I think when we talk about solutions, it is critical that we talk about both the mitigation piece, reducing emissions, and then dealing with the stuff that's in the pipeline, the stuff that we have to learn how to adapt to. And you know, I, I think it's, it's been really interesting because some of the research that's come out from, as a scientist from the science side looking at the connection between climate and conflict, there was a paper that came out in the journal Science in 2013 that, that was essentially a meta-analysis that really tried to look at all of the data that was out there and answer the question, is climate directly connected to conflict? And essentially, the answer was a large and resounding yes. And this was historical data. And really what it shows us is that we haven't actually done a really good job as of right now dealing with these issues. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think you're right in the sense that we really have to come up with solutions that address ongoing issues that we haven't necessarily been really good at in the past, knowing that it is gonna continue to get worse as we move forward. Um, and, and I think you know, a lot of the social science research really shows us that our brains are just not very well wired to dealing with this kind of threat. It's not mm. super visual. And you know, I was looking at this side of, of the room, the great, the great photographs and video that Orville has put together, and heat was the number one response in terms of, con of conflict. So you, know, you crank up the heat just a little, and, and you really see an increase in both you know, individual conflict and then more civil conflict. And heat is one of these things that's really hard to present the right accurate kinds of images of. There's, there's a ton of flooding and hurricanes over there. Um, and, and I think that visually we still struggle with just, just how dangerous heat can be. And I mean, that's what 
Tom was saying, 113 degrees, we know how sensitive crops are to any kind of, of change in heat. So, so yeah, the threat is, is right now, and the urgency just gets cranked up over time. Tom Friedman, the urgency gets cranked up over time, but the response hasn't been one of urgency. Uh, on the front page of your paper the other day, the story that the Trump administration is preparing to allow for more methane release into the atmosphere. Um, Australia's new government has given the energy portfolio to a well-known climate change denier. The premier of Canada's most populous province, Ontario, shutting down his predecessor's climate change initiatives. This is all just in the last two weeks. This is not like six months of headlines. It's just the last two weeks. This doesn't seem like a very urgent response to what looked like a very urgent problem. Well, it's obviously it's madness when you when you see what's what's going on. Um, let me step back, Ray, and, and try to put it in in the historical context that I put it in. Um, so I, you know, we, we know um, that World War One and World War Two uh, birthed a whole bunch of states. The, the world went from being governed by empires to being governed by individual nation states, and at the end of World War II, we found ourselves with like 190 countries, uh, states in the United Nations. And the 50 years after World War II were a great time to be an average state, frankly. Uh, there were two superpowers out there throwing money at you, um, foreign aid, trying to woo you to their side in the Cold War, educating your kids at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow or Wichita State in America, building your government house, sending you uh, food. And if you were Syria, you could lose three wars to Israel and get your army rebuilt all three times, okay? Um, at the same time, populations, everyone had a demographic dividend, lots of young people, a few old people, and population explosion hadn't really taken off for the most part. Um, uh, climate change was relatively moderate <coughs> in those 50 years. And um, uh, communications was limited, hard to compare yourself to the country next door, often the village next door. And most importantly, China was not in the World Trade Organization. So everybody could be in the textile business. Everyone could have low wage industries. Now I argue that what's happened in the early 21st century is all those advantages have flipped. Now su no superpower wants to touch you because uh, all you know, they think they win is a bill. Syria is a, a freak case, number one. Number two, populations have exploded. Number three, pop uh, climate change is now hammering uh, these countries. And number four, China's in the World Trade Organization today, and nobody can be in the textile business, okay? And it's really affected low-wage industries. And what's happened, basically, is these pressures, these stresses, are now fracturing states. Uh, in our hemisphere, it's the one that um, Luis has referred to, um, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, by the way, the three most deforested nations in, in, in Latin America. Um, and of course, in, in Europe, it starts in West Africa, and it goes all the way across North Africa, uh, through the Middle East, right up to the border of India. It's, it's, we, states are either collapsing or they're hemorrhaging people, that they simply cannot um, uh, handle all of these stresses, because it's not just climate, it's climate, population, technology, jobs, growth, and governance. And I think we're on the cusp um, of a period where we're just going to see a lot of these states completely implode. Uh, I think that's where we're going. And what it's doing is creating a vast um, a zone of disorder. And the new geopolitical divide in the world today, the relevant one, is no longer east-west, north-south, communist, capitalist. It's, it's between this vast zone of disorder um, and the world of order and the tens of millions of people who want to get out of the world of disorder into the world of order. Africa currently has a population of 1.2 billion. By 2050, it is projected to be 2.5 billion. Europe has a population of 748 million. By 2050, it's supposed to have a population of around 720 million. You can see where this is going to go. And so vast pressure to get from one to the other. Now, all we're doing in this country is waiting for the perfect storm, a storm so big that it finally ends this stupid debate over climate change, but not so big that it ends the world. That's really what we're, what we're kind of hoping for. 
um, obviously hoping in inverted commas. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's a political class. Well, let's is, remember, right now, millions of people are yes. in their cars heading west from the coastal Carolinas, right. from the Barrier Islands, from Charleston, from Charlotte, heading west on every interstate they can find room on uh, in advance of Thursday's landfall. It's going to be a huge storm. Well, unfortunately, we have a party in power today that's been captured by the fossil fuel industry, and it is completely indifferent to science, to facts, um, uh, to things happening in front of their eyes. And that's why there's only one thing to do, ladies and gentlemen, um, and that is to vote, okay? And if you don't, if, if you don't, you don't vote the right way, um, because what happened in Kevin's country, what happened in our country is, um, uh, uh, is, is a result of a political process, um, and these people will carry it all the way to the edge, I'm afraid. The world in 2018 is tight. The world is tight in a way that earlier in human history it just wasn't. You know, you go to Chaco Canyon, and there was a civilization there that when the rain started to fail, they just picked up and went somewhere else. Yeah. Somalis don't, aren't wanted in northern Kenya. The people of northern Nigeria aren't wanted in Cameroon. The people of northern Nigeria aren't even wanted in southern Nigeria. There's internal displacement. There are farmers pouring off the land into heavily burdened cities. Instead of the rains failing in a place like Zimbabwe once every seven to ten years, they're failing regularly. So Zimbabweans are heading south into South Africa. Um, once upon a time, the Mayars just moved out of the Ural Mountains and walked to Hungary. You can't do that anymore. When you walk somewhere, there's already people there, and they don't want you there, even your own countrymen. If you bring this up in the councils of, of state, President Moreno, are people not paying attention to this? This seems like pretty serious stuff. Well, certainly this is the issue of our times. And what I think is the big contrast is the immense political tension in the West around this issue of immigration, which is different than in emerging countries as many of the things that Tom and Kevin were explaining. And yet, there is tremendous vulnerability. Let, let me give you an example which is not caused by climate change but for entirely different reasons is the case of Venezuela. If you look at the last three years, the numbers of Venezuelans leaving Venezuela for pure economic reasons and for state failure, a country that today its economy is a third of what it was five years ago, a huge humanitarian crisis. Where have those people gone? They're literally like we saw people coming from Syria walking through Austria to go to Germany. They are walking literally from Venezuela through Colombia to go to Ecuador, to Peru. And in the last two years alone, it's been 2.2 million people. I think that this year could get as close to 500,000 people. So in essence, you have more people leaving Venezuela and going into other countries in Latin America than you have going uh, and you had going from the Middle East into Europe. There's a difference. The average income per capita of where those immigrants went from the Middle East into Europe is about $46,000. The average income per capita in these countries in Latin America is about $18,000. I'm talking here purchasing power parity. So the absorption capacity is far less. And yet the tensions that you see in the West are far more intense than the tensions that you see today in these countries. And that should tell you something, as the same is the case with everything related to climate change. People are going and voting to preserve the environment. One of the big, if you look at many of the recent elections in Latin America, people focused and were moved by ways of saying, we're going to preserve the environment. Why? Because they're seeing the cases in front of them. They're seeing how the water is being destroyed. They're seeing how the, the, you know, the rivers and the watersheds that you used to have before are no longer 
they're, they're seeing the explosion of heat. I mean, the one thing that is causing all of these hurricanes is the heat on the water. We remember last year with Irma, and you saw what happened in the Caribbean countries. I pray that we don't see this again in the Caribbean. Think for a country like Haiti, one of the poorest, the poorest country in this hemisphere. If a hurricane like that hits Haiti with 11 million people, I don't want to tell you. They're, not, they're just going to appear everywhere. You're going to, I mean, it's impossible for a country like that to hold it together. So this, this is all climate change related in those cases. And we don't have the cap, those countries don't have the resilience to deal with issues like this. I mean, the fact that you have that huge destruction is buildings are under code, there's no uh, basic resilience built into many of, of, of the countries, and more importantly, the financial instruments to deal with this. The insurance, nobody is going to insure your house or anything else, and so all of this is being compounded to make really, because of all these issues, a process of impoverishment that can be very deep. Ari Cullen, history's single largest emitter, so far hasn't wanted to talk honestly about its responsibility for the state of play today and what's going to roll out for the rest of the century. But in Phoenix, Arizona, the number of days over 90 degrees will soon be well over half the year, scores of days over 100 degrees, one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in America. That maybe will get people's attention. Texas cities now have weeks at a time where the daytime temperatures don't go under 100 degrees. Is it getting people's attention? Is it changing the equation? Is it changing the politics around these questions? You know, I actually think, and maybe I should say I hope it is, and I should say I used to work at the Weather Channel, and so for me, you know, this connection between weather and climate is a really powerful one. And I remember when I first started talking about climate change, public polls would show that when you asked Americans what image came to mind when they thought about climate change, the answer was a polar bear or melting ice. And needless to say, that is not an image that, that screams threat or urgent risk, right? And that was a longitudinal study. That poll continued through time. And, and just this year, the results of that poll came back. And for the first time, the polar bear was no longer the, the image associated, mm -hmm. the number one image associated with climate change. It, it is extreme weather. And so I do think that that because each and every one of us, I mean, if you live in California and you have watched this wildfire season just destroy families, you understand that extreme weather will get all of us in some way, shape, or form. And so I think, I think that has made a, you know, a, a really big impression on, on folks here. And you know, there was a, a poll that came out of Stanford, John Krosnick's group, um, back in July. And what that poll showed was that in the United States, we actually have a bias in the sense that we think conservatives uh, do not believe that climate change is human caused and, and should be addressed urgently, but we overestimate that, that in fact, uh, by and large, 81% of, of Americans support the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, but we think but we, we think that there's more division and opposition than there actually is. And I guess that, that gives me some sense of hope. I mean, I, I recognize, I mean, and you guys are the political experts, so you, you understand far better than I do how, how well dug in the extremes are. But across the board, there's strong support for action. Well, I've served as Prime Minister of the driest continent on Earth. It's called Australia. And I have... Uh fought and won and fought and lost elections on climate change and carbon pricing. Um, it's a, a raw, rare and bloody experience in countries like ours, the United States, um, and you've just referred earlier to Canada as well and what the provincial government of Ontario is doing. So one, the science is clear. It's clear what the causes of climate change are and its consequences in terms of extreme weather events, desertification, everything. So two, 
If it's been clear for so long, why have we failed to act? Well, there's one core reason, is that because it's a global problem, you need the global machinery to be deployed to make it work. And the engine room of the global machinery since 1945 has been this country, the United States of America. And so you have to ask yourself this question, why ain't it working? Uh, I've got to say, knowing a little bit about the carbon lobby, because they were my bitter foes in Australia, they are highly organised, they have bucket loads of money, just like Big Tobacco used to have when it uh, was waging its campaign that smoking was good for you. Um, and because in your country you have effectively unlimited campaign finance, you can have 80% plus people believe in the United States that this is a real factor, but the ability to manipulate the politics of the Congress and of the administration in precisely the reverse direction, like we've seen under uh, the Trump administration, is made possible by the amount of money sloshing around the system delivered through unlimited campaign finance. Now, that is at the cancer at work at the heart of this problem, as I see it. Because if America ain't leading, given you are uh, the, the, the world's remaining superpower, then international machinery ain't working. Well, let me jump in there, because Australia, in addition to being the driest continent on the planet, is also situated in the global south. And in recent decades, instead of looking back to Mother England, has been more at home in this idea that it's a place of the global south. Home to extraction industries, historically small population. Well, now home to incredible extremes Terrible drought now in New South Wales. Dead cows, dead sheep. Great Barrier uh, Reef. And, uh, you know, farmers on television every night um, getting the sympathy of the nation. Apart from the carbon lobby, and, you know, you may be right about the carbon lobby, but there's a real human drama that's playing out in a country that largely has a population that's huddled on the coastline largely uninhabited and uninhabitable interior, if people in your country say, look, we don't want the people of Tuvalu and Kiribati and the Malaccas, we don't want the people from Aceh, we don't want the people from Vanuatu, we can't handle it. There's a lot of oxygen for that argument in your country, isn't there? And I've sought to deploy as much of that oxygen as possible in my period in political office. And it's tough going, not just because of the power of the carbon lobby and, and our country at work as well. But the point was made before about images and media and how is information conveyed to shape the views of the broader, broader body politic. The second big cancer at work in this debate, both in the United States and in Australia, is the Murdoch media. Murdoch is a climate change denier. So when we have all this imagery in Australia of the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef uh, through the warming of the oceans, the greater intensity of droughted events and times and spans in the country, um, the person who owns the 70% of our print media, Rupert Murdoch, will not allow any connectivity to be made between those events and climate change. It is a rolling national exercise in media denial. So if you want the American equivalent of that, watch Fox, for God's sake, and you see the parallel phenomenon at work. So what my point is, you have a cocktail of Murdoch media in your country and in ours, uh, an organized carbon lobby throwing huge amounts of political donations, and that kind of entity is capable of, frankly, frustrating the action that's necessary. My first act as Prime Minister, ratifying the Kyoto Protocol. Second act as Prime Minister, introducing mandatory renewable energy target. We started with virtually no renewable energy. We mandated 20% by 2020. They haven't been able to repeal that so far. We're now up to 18. We legislated twice for a carbon price. First thing the Conservatives did in office was repeal it. Uh, so 
it's hard going. It's not as if the messages are not heard in Australia, but the phenomenal nature of the cash behind the carbon crowd and the media denial through a guy who has a stranglehold, I think, on the future of the Republican Party in this country, which is Fox as this sort of self-feeding feedback loop for an increasingly loopy far right in this country, these factors are alive. And the, therefore, the global system ain't working as it should. Uh, my final point, I think, is about this is, for the time being, in our inability to control those two dynamics, all of us, through citizens' action, through pressure on corporations, uh, through the shareholders, uh, and through other forms of civic uh, political action, through what Governor Brown's doing here in California. This is terrific, and it may eventually see us across the line and defeat these forces. But we are in a fight for the planet. We need to identify who the enemies are, and we need to defeat them. I'll be taking... We'll start taking your questions in just a few minutes. For those of you who still are thinking about what to ask, there are runners here and they're going to get the questions up to me up front, so please do fill out cards and send them up. Uh, President Moreno, are there governments in the hemisphere that are under pressure, either being made less stable by these challenges or already unstable and being made less democratic by these challenges. Uh, you're an organization that helps fund development projects, helps um, draft economic strategies for coming years in these countries. If another horrible hurricane season rolls out in 2018, does it put a place like the Dominican Republic under pressure? Does it put a place like Cuba, which already has copious problems, under even more pressure politically? No question, Ray. I mean, and you have to go far to those countries. Remember Puerto Rico. And it's the United States. And you're still struggling in Puerto Rico. Uh, remember Antigua and Barbuda. There's a whole island that was totally vacated. Uh, you had the same situation in, in the case of, uh, I mean, the fascinating thing of what happened last year with the hurricanes is that it hit U.S. territory, it hit Dutch territory, it hit French territory, uh, English territory, and yet somehow the collective action to deal with the resiliency issues for the fundamental issues was never there. And undoubtedly, these kinds of shocks, not only from the economic vertical, but equally from the political vertical, are very profound because it is such a change, and especially people remember the shock. We see these images, but what comes after in the reconstruction, how the reconstruction and the building back better is done or not done, determines political outcomes. And certainly it is a great opportunity for populism which, by the way, unfortunately, we in Latin America are champions. We never imagined that we would export it in such a way to the Western world. Uh, but, but that's the reality. And so, and so in some, democracies, as a result, are not better served by this. But on the contrary, they have the impact of changing the nature of a more orderly debate where citizens can participate better. And so the way I see it today is how we find ways to do more and more collective action. It is in the hands of the citizens. It is in the hands of the local governments. It's in the hands of the mayors where I see the real transformations taking place because there is no way Republican or Democrat to pick garbage. You just got to pick the garbage. And it is in the local space that I see the real improvements and the real change. Tom, couldn't this just as easily continue to go really badly. I mean, here we are talking about solutions, about people being forced to do the right thing, about the momentum of change, making it clear that, that a different way forward is necessary. We are sometimes a fairly stubborn species, and 
we may do a lot more of the wrong thing before we start to do anything that even remotely resembles the right thing. You know, Ray, I always tell people that I can ruin any dinner party, and I do weddings and bar mitzvahs. So it's, um, uh, uh, you've, you've kind of outdone me tonight. <laughs> um, <clears throat> look, if you're a betting man, that's, uh, uh, that's what you have to bet, you know, that um, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, and it's going to take a gigantic crisis. But, you know, uh, Kevin really outlined, I, I think, really well when you when you have a, um, a network without integrity pushing this, and you have a huge financial interest pushing it, um, it's very hard to break. I think there, there are two things that I would say are, are necessary but not sufficient to break it. Um, uh, one is, I, I really believe uh, that to name something is to own it. You know, if you can name the issue, you can own the issue. And for, for so long, the issue green was really named by the people who hated it. Uh, they owned the definition. They named it liberal, tree-hugging, sissy, girly man, vaguely European. Vaguely European. <laughs> and um, what I have... Which is actually just a synonym for, for all those other for things. For all those other things. <laughs> um, what I've tried to do in my own journalism is rename it geopolitical, geoeconomic, capitalistic, patriotic... Green is the new red, white, blue. That, I think, is essential that you own the language. You cannot let um, them own the language. I think that's, Absolutely. that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that um, you know, uh, people who, who follow my column know I'm, I, I write about technology and the world is flat and all that stuff, but I am actually no friend of social networks. Um, I'm, I'm notoriously... Um, uh, not on. If you're tweeting about me on Twitter, you all have a good time. Um, but I'm not <laughs> there, okay? Because I believe they have created a huge sense of faux activism. Uh, I go around young, young people and you, they say, they'll say, we're well, upset about this and what did you do about it? Well, I tweeted about it. Well, you tweeted about it. That's like firing a mortar into the Milky Way galaxy, okay? I mean, <laughs> all right. So, you know, my mantra is get out of Facebook and into somebody's face. Because ExxonMobil is not in a chat room. As Kevin said, they're in the cloakroom. They're in the cloakroom with bags of money. And you cannot be a nice green. You have to be a mean green. You have to, to understand that there's only one thing as big as Mother Nature, and that is Father Greed. And unless you can get the market leveraged on your side, because energy is a scale problem. Okay, it, it, if you don't have scale, you have a hobby. I like hobbies, I used to build model airplanes. I wouldn't try to change the climate as a hobby. This is a scale issue, and the only way you get scale is when you shape the market with the right standards and regulation. That's what the battle has to be. And, you know, uh, unless, uh, you know, politicians are, are very um, transactional, unless they see people on the street voting on these issues and giving money on these issues, they will do what is the easiest natural thing for them to do, and, and that's take the, the, um, the, least, the course of least resistance. And uh, unfortunately today it's to go, um, uh, uh, certainly with our ruling party today, um, uh, with the fossil fuel industry and with Fox. There was no good time for Donald Trump to be president of the United States. This is a uniquely awful time. Mm -hmm. And to juxtapose what's going on in climate in the world, to pick up the New York Times this morning and see that these people want to get rid of the regulations to restrict methane emissions and natural gas, methane which is so much more potent than um, carbon dioxide, is such sheer madness. Um, uh, I wish I could tell you, Ray, I, I could tell you, this is a line that they will not go beyond. But we now know there is no line. We have a president without shame, backed by a party without spine, supported by a network without integrity. And there's only one way to reverse that, and that is with an election. We'll close out, we'll close out tonight's program getting to your questions. And in the interest of getting to more questions, we'll get briefer answers. <laughs> Please discuss the necessity of effective carbon pricing to blunt the worst-case climate scenarios. 
promising, Kevin Rudd? <laughs> uh, yes, having fought and won elections on carbon pricing. Uh, but the price, whether it's a floating price or a fixed price, f floating through an emissions trading scheme or a fixed price through a carbon tax, the price has to be real so that it changes behaviour. Otherwise, it's frankly as useful as the great Friedman analogy of firing a mortar into the Milky Way. It ain't going to work. Price is essential because it dictates so much economic behaviour. The goodness of my heart is only going to take me so far in solving this problem. The other half is, if that price is high enough, you're going to throw a whole lot, therefore, more resources at finding the big technology breakthrough on what we need most, which is critical mass solar storage on the technology front. Do those two things, and we're starting to get towards core solutions. By the way, I'm not an American, but I'm voting Friedman for public office. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Vote one, Tom Friedman, Planet Party. <laughs> We're having a rational conversation here tonight. Thank you. Uh, not my point, the question is. <laughs> how do we have this conversation in a fact-free environment? Heidi Cullen, is there a lot of pseudoscience floating out there that has to be combated along with telling people what's up? Do you also have to put out the fires, so to speak, of the things that just ain't so that people believe? Yeah, I mean... For me, as, as a scientist, uh, as someone who cares very deeply about making decisions based on the best available evidence, um, I, I do feel very strongly that you know, this is an incredibly important moment for us to acknowledge the importance of evidence-based decision-making, the importance of using data wisely. Um, but it's funny, because at the same time, as a scientist who's worked on climate change for a long time now, I have been told over and over again that, that um, facts will not sway people, uh, that, that we really do need to meet people where they are and speak to their values. And I, I feel like, you know, Kevin, probably of all of us, you have a lot of experience with this. And Scar tissue, not experience. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I guess then for me, it's to say that evidence-based decision-making is something that I value tremendously, but at the same time, I... I when I speak with folks from, from different parts of the country, I recognize that everyone is looking at this issue from a very specific vantage point. And I, I do think that we have to come together and find a way to talk about it um, so that it is informed by the best available science, but that, that everyone can see that it, it deeply affects all of us. Luis Alberto Moreno, we're hearing a lot of gloom and doom tonight. <laughs> Can any of you point out some positive developments? Give us a little hope for the future. Look, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Look, I think more and more what I find fascinating is the numbers of people who are willing to put money to these issues and test ideas. Maybe they have not been scaled up to the level they should be, but I find, at least in the work that we do, across Latin America, thinking of doing exchanges for Natural Capital Lab, where you can begin to price uh, you know, things. On the one hand, you have a, a take a forest, and then how do you think of that forest where you can preserve it, put, it, put a price to that capital? There's things that will be generated through ecotourism or water, but there's others on indigenous people and things like that. And I find more and more enthusiasm of people really wanting to do actionable things. And this is probably the, the, the area that gives you uh, hope. The, the problem is the, there is a disconnect at the speed of the reaction that we need to have. And that is what doesn't make you very optimistic. Because you can be very happy with Prusov's concept of ideas, of things that get tested. Of pro I see it in Latin America in the last 10 years. 10% of the landmass has been protected. And that's a great thing. But the scope of what we need to do vis-a-vis -vis resilience and all these other areas is so much bigger that that's where the anxiety comes in. Tom, in the analysis of climate change, 
uh, we've been pointing to socio-political conflict. Has there been a connection to climate change in the Arab Spring, in Tunisia and other countries? Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, the Arab Spring uh, in Tunisia erupted in December uh, of 2010 um, when, a, ironically, a vegetable seller was um, uh, arrested for not having a um, license in Tunis and uh, slapped by a policewoman and he eventually uh, immolated himself. And that's what triggered it all. Uh, December 2010, world food prices hit an all-time high. And they hit an all-time high um, because uh, uh, floods and drought in Australia, uh, wildfires in, in uh, uh, southern Russia, uh, China, and uh, Kansas, all, 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 all of these variations of flood, drought, wildfire, had wiped out the entire surplus of the global wheat market. Uh, and um, in the Middle East, I believe it's nine out of 10 countries are wheat importers. Uh, Egypt is the biggest wheat importer of them all. Um, and that's why the chant in the streets of Cairo uh, was um, uh, for the Arab Spring was bread, freedom, dignity. Um, uh, in Years of Living Dangerously, uh, we did two other shows. We did one in Yemen um, and showed the relationship between the water crisis there and the conflict. And we did one in Egypt. And our show on Egypt, um, uh, we began in a bakery um, uh, at five in the morning where scores of very poor Kyrenes lined up at five in the morning to get government subsidized pita. Um, and basically, they had to get up that early because they would run out of the government subsidized pizza, pizza in an hour or so. Um, uh, and the reason they ran out, uh, as we filmed right before our very eyes, um, uh, the baker would sell his government subsidized wheat um, to private bakers at a vast markup. And so all of these things were connected. Uh, the global wheat crisis, created a huge spike in food prices and in these countries, uh, as Luis uh, you know, noted, where people live a very close margin and um, very narrow margin. And so when um, the price of bread and basic staples goes up, uh, you, know, you, have, you have a real political crisis and, that, and that's what happened. So um, the, the Arab Spring is, is all tied in um, to this climate story. I think, I think the point really that people have to realize is that there isn't, climate is one stress. Population is another stress. Um, work is another stress. That is that um, average work no longer returns average pay because machines can do so much more of that. Globalization and the stresses of, of, of keeping up as a country. That's why I go back to these 50 years when it was a great time to be an average worker or an average country. And that period is over. And that's why I think we're going to be heading for a much more unstable global politics, not just because climate, that's one stressor, but because of all of these other stressors that are converging as well. Climate-related distress migration is not a cause of white supremacy. How do you propose we deal with the rise of the right without justifying it by linking it to the movement of brown people into white countries. Is that for anybody in particular? <laughs> anybody wants to jump in? It's a, it's a tough one. You know, I, I would just say this very quickly, that um, uh, to, to Heidi's point about, you know, how, do you, how do you talk to people who are not going to believe the climate debate? And, and the way I do it is that, um, because uh, I think it's very important to talk uh, and engage people. And I, I begin by saying, look, you don't believe in climate change, I do. Um, that's between you and your beach house, okay? Let's just keep that over here, okay? Um, but let's assume we can all agree on math, okay? There are 7.2 billion people on the planet today. Um, uh, by 2030, there's going to be 2030. That's, that's not very far off. There's going to be another billion people on the planet. Uh, by 20. 50, there's going to be um, another two and a half billion. Now, if all those people want to live like us, drive American-sized cars, live in American-sized homes, eat American-sized Big Macs, we're going to burn up, clean, uh, uh, we're going to burn up, um, heat up, 
uh, eat up this planet uh, at a speed, scope, and scale far greater than even Al Gore has ever predicted. So what does that tell you? What that tells you is that if we don't want to be a bad biological experiment, clean power, clean energy, energy efficiency have to be the next great global industry. Well, who here believes, please raise your hand, if you think America can be a great economic power and not lead the next great global industry? And I think when you engage people on that, I'm not saying this is some magic formula, but at least there you can actually enter in an argument. This is the source of jobs, source of innovation, source of economic strength. That's one big thing. The other thing I think that I learned from doing the trip to Senegal in that village, and we just had a little bit of it from you didn't know who's who in that scene, but it's actually the chief talking. And what he's talking about is he's watching his community break down. And he, he actually starts crying later on because all the young men are leaving. And I think one way to, you know, if I were talking to people in West Virginia, I think the way you've got to begin the conversation is by saying, I know why you, you're, you're sticking to coal. It's not because you want to go down in a mine shaft five days a week. Um, it's not because you want your kid to do that the way you did it. It's because it's what anchors your community. It's what keeps you around your friends, your relatives, the hills you know, the music you know, the food you know, the clothes you know. It's, it's the anchoring of your community. And I think if you start the conversation there and affirming that, because that's what everyone loves. That's what that chief wants. He just wants to hold on to his little community, as poor as it is. If you start the conversation there by saying, I understand what's animating you. It's your love of community and your desire to stay here. How can we do that without you having to go into a coal mine every day? But if you start the conversation by saying you're a moron, a deplorable, because uh, you're holding on to coal, then they're going to hold on to that more tightly than ever. Much of the analysis and many of the solutions focus on the political. What about the fact that we humans have fundamentally a Stone Age brain in a modern and complex world? Do you see a role for neuroscientists, psychologists, <laughs> anthropologists in helping toward solutions? And we only have one scientist on the panel. <laughs> yes, yes, we need more people thinking about ways to work on this. And, you know, it's funny, when I was in graduate school, my very first research project was actually studying civilization collapse. Um, mm. I studied the Akkadian Empire, which is the world's first yeah. empire. It collapsed. And what was so interesting to me as, as a climate scientist was that the thought that climate, in this case a prolonged drought, might have played a role in the toppling of this civilization was kind of heresy in archaeology and, and history circles because the, the answers for why civilizations collapsed were essentially human caused. It was you know, warfare, it was disease, it was politics. And, and so I guess for me, for my entire career, it's been this recognition that climate just never really has surfaced um, as, as this big player when in fact you know, the, the research project that I, I, I worked on, it showed definitively that there was a, a decades-long drought that happened at the very same time that this civilization collapsed. So it's, it's completely consistent with what we've been talking about this evening, which is that climate is, is, this, is this very important player, but it's really hard to see and feel and, and taste and touch until you've personally experienced that, that extreme weather. And so... From, from the science perspective, we do need all of these different perspectives thinking about it because the solution has eluded us for, for centuries and, and, and millennia. Our, our brains are just not very well adapted to, to solving these, these long-term problems. And that's, for me as a scientist, where data and, and decision-making becomes really important because we need to play out these scenarios and understand what's coming at us so that we can stop them before they happen. That's, that's really the point of I'm it. I'm no neuroscientist. I mean, I'm a graduate in Chinese language, so what do I know about neuroscience? Mm -hmm. yeah. But one, one thought on this is what neuroscience tells us about politics and what the most skilled political campaigners do uh, is they understand what fires up people's brains. 
We know how closely neuroscience works, for example, on the politics of fear. The politics of fear, when harnessed around the climate change debate, is usually along these lines. If you act decisively on uh, reducing carbon emissions, you're going to throw millions of people out of work, you're going to increase living standards for working people, uh, sorry, increase the cost of living for working people, uh, and the economy will go bust. And this excites the, neuro the neurological response of fear. So I'm going to flee from that. The parallel thing is, because we have at present a discourse on climate change on our side of the argument, which is often seen as gloom, doom and despair, without hope that it actually induces psychologically learned hopelessness. That is, there's no point. It's, there's no way through this. So on our side of the argument, taking seriously the neurological construction of the way in which people respond to politics and information is critical so that we can construct a rational basis for hope to cause people to say there's a way through this and it can be done, while simultaneously exposing the exploitation of the neuroscience of fear about the bogus arguments that are going to collapse your economy, cause California to go bust and the lights to go out by two years ago, which never happened. Luis Alberto Moreno, whether the wall gets built or not, the same climate trends that currently are gripping Arizona and Texas are also gripping the states of northern Mexico. Is that going to continue to be a spur to migration north? And will that continue to have the effect that we've already seen on American politics? Well, certainly, uh, you know, a lot of this migration that, that is happening is, has a, uh, as we have been talking all along the panel and as uh, uh, Tom's previous uh, points with his, uh, with his uh, 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 documentary, clearly there's an element that is pushing migration that starts with climate change, and it is all of the areas that you have just described. This will only bring, unfortunately, more tension. And how do we deal with that tension is going to be central in the years ahead. If, if we are not able to deal with these tensions, eh, very quickly you will be talking about how climate change led to wars. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen between Mexico and the United States anytime soon. Uh, People would, in Mexico would tell you they're happy to build a wall with the old borders. <laughs> uh, and they will pay for that wall. <laughs> so I leave it there. <laughs> that's great. They get California, Texas. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for tonight. I'm Ray Suarez. On behalf of World Affairs and Coal and Ice... Well, join me. I was going to say join me, but you've already been joining me in thanking Dr. Cullen and Mr. Friedman, Moreno, and Rudd for this wonderful discussion. And many thanks to you as well, audience, for your participation and your excellent questions. Good night. Thanks for joining us.